The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. And now the word of the Lord as it comes to us in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I kind of like this open space here. It means I can, I can really wander as I preach. You know, in seminary, they teach you to never think about anyone specifically when you preach a sermon. Don't target anyone. Don't sit there as you're preparing thinking to yourself, boy, I hope she hears this. Well, seminary was a long time ago, and I've pretty much forgotten about that rule, because uh, we're starting a series in 2 Timothy, and I do have specific people in mind. All of you, of course, but you, and you, and you. This is a series that focuses on the Apostle Paul passing the torch. Second Timothy is his last book, written maybe six months before his death. So as uh, we work our way through God's word, Let's let it sink into our hearts and fit us for the work of service that he has for us all the rest of the days of our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It is truth. Thank you for your word. It equips us. Thank you for your word. It fills us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This little letter, 2 Timothy, is uh, called by uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Apostle Paul's Farewell Address. Uh, Bill Lane calls it his swan song. Uh, John R. W. Stott calls it his grand finale. The Apostle Paul, uh, by the time he writes this letter, is in prison in Rome. It's, in a sense, the capstone of 35 years of ministry. Uh, The Bible tells us uh, that the Apostle Paul uh, was converted on his way to Damascus uh, as uh, as he was persecuting the saints. He was very deliberately seeking them out to arrest them. Uh, But God struck him down, knocked him off his high horse, and he was taken to the city of Damascus where he heard the word of truth. That was probably about 18 months after the resurrection of Christ. Almost immediately, he began a ministry. As a former Pharisee, he knew the Old Testament And he applied it immediately to the gospel, as he does in the books of Romans and 1 Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians. 
that now he undertakes a ministry there in Damascus. Some scholars believe that he was there as long as three years before he was harried out of the city. But at that point, he went into the wilderness, what he calls Arabia. We don't know exactly where that was. But sometime around the year 36, he makes his way back to his hometown, Tarsus, uh, which is uh, right on the edge between Syria and Turkey today. Uh, And uh, there he began a further ministry. Uh, That ministry lasted until about 43 uh, when Barnabas came from Antioch just across the Bay of Isos, Uh, from uh, Tarsus uh, and brought him to the church there. They began a ministry together in that church for about a year before he then uh, went with Barnabas to Jerusalem, making their way back to Antioch. They were commissioned to go on a missions trip uh, to uh, spread the good news. And uh, that first missionary journey with Barnabas, sometime around the year 46, I went from Antioch in Syria to Seleucia, Cyprus, Salamis, uh, to to Galatia, including the cities of Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, where very likely Eunice and Lois were converted. Um, Then uh, Paul comes back. Uh, There is the Council of Jerusalem in about 49 In the year 50, Paul sets out on a second missionary journey, this time without Barnabas. Instead, uh, he takes with him Silas. He makes his way back uh, to Cilicia, to uh, Derbe, Lystra, Iconium, uh, and then receives the Macedonian call, crosses over to Macedonia, and then down into Greece. He makes his way to (coughs) the cities of Berea, and then... Uh, Athens and Corinth, uh, and uh, all along the way, he is uh, he's proclaiming the gospel, he's planting churches. Uh, he picked up young Timothy, the son of uh, the son and grandson of believers in Galatia, and together they're ministering all the way through Greece. The third missionary journey begins in about fifty three. Uh, And again, they visit all of those other cities uh, along with Ephesus and Philippi and Rhodes uh, and Tyre and Caesarea and then back to Jerusalem. Paul is arrested there in Jerusalem uh, and he's held uh, a number of uh, different jurisdictions, pass him along because no charges can be found to bring against him, plus He's a Roman citizen, and so he has specific legal rights. Uh, After his arrest and imprisonment, he appeals uh, to Caesar, and he's taken to Rome. Uh, There, he awaits trial before Nero himself, but he's acquitted. Sometime around the year 62, according to uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 16, Uh, where Paul uh, refers to his first trial. Um, Two years earlier, uh, he had been told that there were no charges before Herod Agrippa and Festus the king. Uh, uh, He says, uh, uh, there is no reason why this man should die or be put in jail, Acts 26. So Agrippa said to Festus, we need to let this man go free. But he's asked for Caesar to hear his case. Well, uh, after his acquittal, uh, the Apostle Paul left Rome and embarked on a fourth missionary journey. This one is not as well attested in the New Testament. uh, But we're fairly certain that he went to Crete, uh, where he left Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Acts chapter 27. He visited Miletus. Uh, and uh, left Trophimius there because he was ill, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 20. And then he left Timothy as the pastor of the church in Ephesus, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. He may actually have also visited Colossae, uh, 
Paul then went on to Macedonia um, and then made his way back uh, toward Rome when he's arrested a second time, sometime around the year 66 or 67. Uh, He's imprisoned in Rome's notorious Mamertine prison, and from there he writes this second letter to his son Timothy because he expects this time that he will be convicted and executed, and so he was. So this is his last will and testament. It begins in a typical epistolatory style. In fact, it's almost identical uh, to, the, uh, to the greeting that we see in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. There are only three words that are different. Uh, Paul uh, simply uh, calls Timothy his chosen or true son in 1 Timothy, as opposed to his beloved child uh, here in uh, 2 Timothy. He, um, he makes reference to the hope that we have in Christ rather than the promise of life in Christ. And he says that he's an apostle by the command of God rather than, as here, by the will of God. But almost identical. So uh, Paul is making it a very familiar uh, for, for Timothy. Um, he also utilizes uh, something that he uh, has in 1 Timothy, a kind of literary parallelism. Uh, you'll notice it. Uh, Paul's calling by the will of God, verse 2, and Timothy's calling by the laying on of hands in verse 6. Paul's covenantal legacy with his ancestors in verse 2 uh, and 3. Uh, Timothy's covenantal legacy uh, with his grandmother and his mother. Paul's affection, uh, he, uh, he loves him as a beloved child, verse 2. Timothy's affection, his tears for the Apostle Paul in verse 4. There's even a bit of parallelism uh, with uh, grace, mercy, and peace in verse 1, uh, and the power, love, and self-control in verse 7. Uh, But I want you to notice that in all of this, we have the gospel infused. All of these gifts, all of these callings, all of these mercies are all according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus. Paul, even in his greeting, suffuses his message in the gospel. After the greeting, the rest of this passage takes the form of an exhortation. Uh, And now our natural inclination uh, when we read this exhortation is to focus on the final clause, fan the flame, the gift of God in you, verse 6, because God has not given you a spirit of fear, uh, but of of, uh, power and of love, and of self-control, verse 7. And that is the conclusion of the exhortation, but it's not the heart of the exhortation. The heart of the exhortation is very simple. He says to Timothy, I want you to remember. I want you to know that I remember you in my prayers, verse 3. I remember your tears, verse 4. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, verse 5. And it is for this reason that I now remind you to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you, verse 6. Alexander McClellan Uh, says uh, it this way. He says, Paul's counsel is delicately introduced and equally delicately expressed as putting in remembrance rather than as enjoining authoritatively. Paul wants Timothy to remember. Truth is, uh, again and again, the scriptures call upon all of God's people to remember. That we are to remember the bondage 
uh, oppression and deliverance out of Egypt. Uh, We're to remember the splendor, the strength, and the devotion of the Davidic kingdom. Uh, We're to remember uh, the valor, forthrightness, and holiness of the prophets. We're to remember the glories of creation, the devastation of the flood, the judgment of the great apostasies, uh, the anguish of the desert wanderings, uh, the horrors and grief of the Babylonian exile. And we are to remember the Sabbath day and sanctify it fully. Indeed, now, one of the things that we see through the scriptures is that remembrance is the measuring rod of faithfulness. This is why the Bible makes plain in James uh, chapter 1 that there are really only two kinds of people in the world. Forgetful hearers and those who faithfully remember effectual doers. So Paul uh, calls upon Timothy to remember. Many commentators say, in a sense, uh, this section of 2 Timothy is Paul's auld lang syne. That uh, he is uh, he's reminiscing. That, that he's uh, waxing nostalgic. But in fact, he's done nothing of the sort What he's telling Timothy is simply, remember the works of God in your life. Remember the gospel. Lay hold of that promise of life in Jesus Christ. He says to him, look, if you remember that God exercises his will, verse 1, That he dispenses his grace and his mercy and his peace, verse 2. If you remember that God hears all of our prayers, verse 3. If you remember that he fills us with joy, verse 4. If you remember that he surrounds us with covenantal care, verse 5. If we remember that he bestows on us God's good gifts, verse 6. And that he equips us with power, love, and self-control. Verse 7, what have we to fear? This is the whole gospel. This is the promise that when called by the Father, redeemed by the Son, sealed in the Spirit, nothing shall deter God's purposes for our lives from being fulfilled. Nothing. Timothy needs to remember this. Can you imagine what it must be like for Timothy after 30 years of walking with the Apostle Paul, coming to the realization that soon he will be gone? What will the world be like Without the Apostle Paul. Paul is simply saying, it's not about me. My job was always to work myself out of a job. I love the story of Thomas Chalmers, as you know. Uh, Chalmers, according to uh, the great historian Andrew Murray, When he was born in 1780, it was about the deadest time in the history of the Church of Scotland since the Reformation. And when he died in 1847, it was about the alivest. And the difference was almost entirely attributable to the Spirit's work through him. He was the undisputed leader of a vibrant evangelical a resurgence throughout Scotland. He had one of the most fruitful ministries in the whole history of the church. Spurgeon called him the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul. Uh, he accomplished great things as a pastor, as a professor, as a church planter, as a publisher, as a, a, a missions founder. He established Bible societies, and he raised funds to plant a myriad of churches. But his greatest accomplishment 
was that he worked all of his life to work himself out of a job by raising up the next generation of leaders. Uh, People like Robert Murray McShane and Andrew Bonar and Robert Chalmers Burns and a host of others. After his death, Kelton McPhee would exclaim, Scotland is now filled with men who never weary in giving utterance to their feelings when they speak of those times of happy excitement spent while the great man held the mind and the soul and all present in his powerful grasp, he sent them forth over the surface of the earth, a host of men, so that now every parish has a young would-be Chalmers. W.M. Taylor observed, to the end of his days, he had him around him a circle of loving and devoted disciples, all of whom were fired with enthusiasm, which they had caught from his lips. He was not so much an instructor as a quickener. Uh, The other professors laid materials in the minds of uh, their students. Uh, The other pastors taught with zeal. But he brought and struck the match which kindled these materials into flame and burned with an energy and a kindred of his own. But here's the thing. Chalmers never had a plan. He never had a system. There was no structure. He simply gathered around him those who would receive the ordinary means of grace. And he fed them on those means. He loved them. He blessed them. He prayed for them. He affirmed them. He exhorted them. He warned them. He instructed them. He reminded them to remember the gospel. Notice, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul does here. Did you see it? He loved Timothy, verse 2. He blessed Timothy, verse 2. He prayed for Timothy, verse 3. He affirmed Timothy, verse 4. He exhorted Timothy, verse 6. He warned Timothy, verse 7. He instructed Timothy, verse 7. He reminded him of the gospel, the promise of life in Christ Jesus, verse 1. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul tells that the Ephesians that uh, God pours out gifts on his saints. There are a myriad of gifts. But one of the gifts is the gift of the pastor-teacher. He gave some as pastors and teachers. Now, oftentimes we just stop right there. We go, oh, cool. There, there are some that are called to be pastors and teachers. But Paul explains why in chapter 4, verse 11. He gave some to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, Paul says, pastors, teachers, here's your job. Work yourself out of a job. Raise up the next generation. Equip them, love them, send them, and let God receive all the glory. We have not seen the likes of a Chalmers, but we can follow in his footsteps. We have not seen the likes of a Spurgeon, but we can follow in his footsteps. And that's the great call. Paul, in his last months, says, Timothy, this is the gospel. And that's all that matters. This is the gospel. It's the promise of life. This is the gospel. Remember the gospel. And walk it out. Do not fear. 
This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.